It's time to sit back and relax with your favorite drink. And listen. I'm a deputy in a rural county. I met the devil on night shift. I worked for a sheriff's department in East Texas for the first two years I was a cop. I currently work at another department in the same area. I'm going to have to change names so I don't get into any legal trouble or upset surviving family. Also, don't want to rustle any feathers with colleagues. The law enforcement community is very tight-knit and egos bruise like bananas. Some of you will probably deduce what county I'm talking about from the few clues I give you anyways. But i got to change up the story enough for plausible deniability. You know the drill. Standard creepy pasta stuff. My county was as big as Dallas or Austin County, but only has a population of 14,000 people in it. A lot of places you can only travel on foot. It's as bayou as you can get and still be in Texas. Creeks and rivers run through it like veins, proning the area to flash floods. The most common sight is tightly packed forests pushed up against black top roads. The most common way to die is falling asleep at the wheel or being ambushed by a suicidal deer. Since there's not a lot of people, and these people are poor, it means deputies are paid crap. Not that I was only in it for the pay. I I love being a cop. I pledged to be one of the good ones that stuck to his ideals and didn't become a cynical asshole. Well, I stuck to my ideals, but became more of an asshole each passing day. What's worse than the pay is the safety concerns. There are only two deputies out on a given night. One for the south end and one for north. This means your only backup is usually 20 to 40 minutes away from you. And if your partner's also handling an emergency, then you're out of luck. This made the area seem like one of the last remaining bits of the Wild West. You really had to keep your wits sharp and watch your six when all alone in the woods. As romantic as the idea was of being like Walker, Texas Ranger, it almost got me killed. It was a perfect storm of circumstances. My county had suffered severe flooding the week before this story happened. The water was going down in most parts, but some places were still flooded. Another great thing was our radios had been down all day. Someone coming to fix it in the morning, and the rain began pouring down. The call came in around midnight about a man beating on a woman's door. The man was demanding to be let in out of the rain. The woman said she was alone with her baby and needed a cop fast. I was in the dispatch located in the jail side of the sheriff's department when the call came in. My dispatcher, who was like a mother hen, gave me a look. The, I've got a live one, look. Her eyebrows raised as she snapped at me to get my attention. Her phone tucked to her ear while the other hand typed furiously. I listened to her repeat information out loud for me as I scribbled down the caller's address in my notepad. It was in the flash flood zone. It was passable, but the continuing storm was changing this quick. Another hour of hard rain would cut it off from the rest of the world. My dispatcher swiveled in her chair to look right at me, her face serious. Call on me when you get close. Radios are still down, so I'll call you every ten minutes for a security check. Got it, I said as I spun around to hurry to my patrol car. I let the South End deputy know what you got in case he needs to get to you, she quipped as the heavy door to the jail slammed behind me. I appreciated the gesture from her, but but having backup almost an hour away didn't mean much if things popped off. Backup could be coming from the moon for all the difference it would make. I squeezed myself into the crowded front seat of my patrol vehicle. I hadn't even entered the address into my onboard GPS when my phone started ringing. It was dispatch. What do you got? I asked. There was an unusual pause before she spoke. I could hear the concern in her voice. Hey, I just learned this. Our caller said it might be Ezekiel Burrows out there. I paused before turning the key in the ignition. This was not good. I'd dealt with Zeke before. It's back when I was a rookie. Well, I'll have to put this story on hold to fill you in with a flashback episode first. So I'd been working for about two weeks at the time. 
I was still riding shotgun with my FTO. An anonymous caller rang the sheriff's department complaining Zeke and his old brother were driving around pointing guns at people and firing into the air. Now, my FTO was a stereotype of an old county cop who was about to retire. He was laid back and calmly gave instructions between drags of a cigarette. He wore a bushy white walrus moustache and cowboy hat that fitted him perfectly. When the call came across the radio, his demeanor flipped like a switch. He sat forward and flicked his cig out of the window. His face darkened. Okay, deputy, this could get serious. Stay alert, stay close, and do everything I tell you. We were burning towards the call pretty fast when he offered his additional piece of information. I know these two brothers. They've been known to fight with police. Don't be afraid to go hands-on if you need to, he said in his slow Texas drawl. My body dumped a ton of adrenaline for a fight or flight response, and I felt my stomach turn. I was glad my FTO was so calm for me. In those days, I used to be ashamed of the butterflies in my stomach. I thought it meant I was weak or a coward. Now I realize it's my body's way of protecting itself, and I needed to embrace the feeling. We found the brothers slow rolling around in a hunter green Dodge Neon. It was missing a driver's side mirror and had a giant hole where a red brake light should be. It was great when they made our job easy. <laughs> we initiated a felony takedown. That's pretty much when you point your weapon at the suspect vehicle while standing behind your open car door. You give loud verbal commands like, Driver, step out of the vehicle slowly. Anyway, we had both of them pulled out and detained in handcuffs. Nothing of note really happened except for there being two shotguns and three rifles in the back seat. Ammo and shell casings everywhere. Not illegal in the state of Texas, just highly suspicious. The original caller wanted to remain anonymous, so we had nothing to prove they were firing from the vehicle. My FDO dealt with Zeke's older brother while well, I talked with Zeke. Well, I can't remember the brother's name. We'll just call him Turd for now. My FDO had our dispatch run both of their names to see if they had any active warrants. So we got some tense and awkward minutes with the brothers while they waited to see if they were going to jail or not. Turd ran at the mouth for the duration of the stop. Called us every racist and vulgar thing in his extensive vocabulary of no-no words. Me, being a rookie, got a little flustered at some of the things he'd allegedly done to my mother. So I turned my attention to Zeke. Zeke stood there downcast and drenched in sweat. It was only 80 degrees, but he looked like he was about to suffer a heat stroke. His whole body began to tremble slightly and sway back and forth. You okay, Zeke? I asked as I stepped closer to him. I thought I might have to catch him if he passed out on me. You see, Zeke smelt like hot garbage. Oof, it was pretty overpowering. A mixture of sweat and ass. I didn't want to touch him. He was cuffed behind his back. I couldn't let him tip over with nothing but his head to break his fall. Lucky for me, Zeke straightened up when I reached for him. His eyes bulged as he looked right at me. His teeth bared in a grimace. Is this one gonna kill me, Jesus? He whispered in a raspy voice. His vacant eyes locked with mine. No, Zeke. You're just being detained while we check if it's good to let you and your brothers go. I said, well, trying to hide how creeped out I was. Zeke paused and tilted his head to the side slightly. A smirk touched the edge of his mouth as he nodded like he was in agreement with something. The next thing he said was something really strange. It's been a while since that day, so my memory is foggy, but I remember it being something like... I'm supposed to tell you to remember my face during the massacre. What? I said as I turned to face him squarely. His brother must have heard the change in my tone of voice. He leaned over to yell past my FDO. Ah, keep your mouth shut, Z. Let me handle these pigs. Zeke considered his brother calmly and replied, You'll be all alone when you die, brother. Turd's eyes widened and I saw pure fear flash across his face. He scoffed and tried to play it off by laughing, but 
I could see through his bravado. His brother scared him. Long story short, both brothers came back clear of warrants. The original 911 caller wanted to remain anonymous. This meant we had no witness to any alleged illegal activity. With nothing to hold them for, we let them loose. But I do remember one more creepy thing Zeke said. When they were uncuffed, the two walked back to their car. Turd went for the driver's seat and Zeke went to sit in the seat behind him. I'm your chauffeur now, Bish, Turd asked angrily. Zeke was staring at something in the passenger seat while shaking his head slowly. No, Zeke replied coolly. He's already sitting there. I'm not going to make him mad. He's been staring at you all day. Turd sent something muffled to Zeke and got into the driver's seat. As they drove away, I could see Zeke sitting in the back, half-turned and pointing at something beside his brother in the passenger seat. Before they pulled out of earshot, I could hear Turd begin to scream profanities at his brother. So that's the, uh, previously on the TV show of my life. That was my first run-in with Zeke. Now it seemed I was racing to him again years later. Zeke's little origin story always sat different with me. I never encountered him in person after that initial contact, but word of his exploits would always reach me. An elderly woman had her door kicked in by the two brothers. She was beaten and robbed. Didn't call the cops until a week later because her grandson made her. She was too terrified to give a witness statement, but the grandson told me the entire street knew it was Zeke and Turd. An outdoor birthday party cancelled when Zeke popped out of the woods and started firing a shotgun in the air. I spent the rest of the night trying to reel in a trigger-happy relative looking for Zeke in the woods. A caller we 90% knew was Zeke kept calling dispatch and threatened to kill a sheriff on recorded lines. He was mad his brother had been arrested. Problem was, Turd was arrested by a neighboring county, not us. It was evident Zeke was sliding further and further to the dark side. He was the Riddler to my Batman. I could never catch up with him. He just left problems for me to deal with. But now, maybe, I had him. I could physically put cuffs on him. My GPS said I was ten minutes out from the caller's house. It was going to be a little longer because of the downpour. Visibility was low and I could feel my ride trying to hydroplane a few times. When I was about two minutes out, the road before me just seemed to disappear. The white lines just vanished as water flooded the road. Turning on my takedown lights didn't reveal where the high water ended, so I stepped out of my car to take a better look. In the darkness, all I could hear was the sporadic thumping of droplets hitting my raincoat and the mechanical back and forth of my wipers in overdrive. Before me was a flat plain of water rippling from millions of raindrops. Every few seconds, the area would illuminate with lightning, Showing me the deep water continued around the bend in the road. My mind went back to the PS1 days of Silent Hill. First thing I did as a terrified fifth grader was try to leave the town, only to find an endless drop-off in the dense fog. I had the similar feeling of dread now, but this time it was an impromptu lake and not a cliff, and I was running towards the danger, not away from it. I was weighing my options and considered letting dispatch know it was impassable. I was in a charger, not a Tahoe. Maybe Zeke found somewhere else to stay dry, I mean. And I mean, he hasn't broken any laws yet. My phone began to ring. It was dispatch. Before I could even say hello, I was met with, You there yet, deputy? I'm around the corner. Look, there's... He's back. My dispatcher half shouted. She's saying he's kicking the door and beating on the windows. I can hear him threatening to hurt her in the background. At this moment, only one course of action was clear. I guess I'd be swimming if I had to. I slowly but steadily submerged my vehicle into the dark waters. I was praying it wouldn't drown out as the waters rose to about two feet high around me. Water began seeping in from the bottoms of the doors as I made my way around the bend in the road. I could see land before me as I began to get more traction and pull up out of the water. 
I gassed my vehicle to give it one last lurch to exit the water and spin out into the muddy road. I hit the brakes to get a quick layout of my surroundings. The red stop sign of a four-way intersection reflected back at me. I was now in a small residential community. My GPS told me the caller's house was across the intersection and three houses down on the left. It was hard to see it through the downpour, but I could see the road disappear under the water again. I got out and began to walk. I wasn't going to risk getting my car stuck and trapped in the driveway. As I sloshed forward, tension began to build in the back of my neck. Silent lightning would periodically illuminate me in a sea of ripples. A cold feeling surrounded my thoughts. A black hole opened in my stomach, sucking all the confidence from me. This was new. I'd been scared before, but fight or flight always set in with a burst of nervous energy. But this was surreal. I felt like I was dreaming. I felt dread. I felt alone. I was in water up to my knees when I reached the yard. I finally got some higher ground the closer I came to the front door. I squished around to my left and my right, checking the sides of the house. The house was a double-sized trailer elevated three feet off the ground on stilts. I had to walk up the steep stairs to knock on the door. Sheriff's Department, I yelled over the rain. I jumped back down with a splash of the narrow steps and scanned the darkness. I had heard rumbling at the door as it opened a couple of inches. I could see a feminine face peeking out at me. Can I see a badge or something? came her fearful voice. I cocked my head at this before I realized I was completely covered in my yellow wired up raincoat. I unbuttoned my trench coat and shot my flashlight on my badge and duty belt. He was here just now, she said nervously. Her eyes darted back and forth, scanning the darkness. I could hear the frantic cries of her child from deeper in the house. Lock the door, but stay by for me. I'll check around back, so don't worry if you hear me making noise back there. I waited till I heard her lock the door before pulling out my gun and circling around to the left. I circled round the whole house slowly, making the corners with deliberate slowness. My small but powerful flashlight held at the center of my chest with my gun at low, ready. The entire perimeter of the house checked clear. My head was on a swivel, checking the thick forest pushing in from the darkness. I even checked her small car pulled on the doors to see if they were left unlocked. There was nothing suspicious. He was gone. But I felt eyes on me. The cold dread sat heavy in my stomach, making me slightly nauseous. I could feel a nervous tingle at the base of my skull, making me want to turn my head frequently. Then the obvious realization hit me, causing an extra punch to the gut. He was under the house. It was three feet off the ground. My dumb ass had been walking around him. I was standing with my back a foot away from the house. I immediately dropped to one knee with a splash and twist to aim my weapon and light under the house. My mind half expecting the jump scare from Zeke, akin to the scene where they first show the xenomorph in the vents on Alien. My finger slowly loosened off the trigger as I saw nothing but interlocking planks of wood, cobwebs, and more darkness. I couldn't see fully under the house because it had been used to store old junk like a lawnmower, sandbags, and old bicycles. I stared intently for a while, trying to make out a human form. Every time I moved the blinding beam of light, it caused dark shadows to dance underneath, mimicking movement. I wasn't satisfied that he wasn't under there, but I couldn't see a damn thing. I backed away from the house and began to think. He was near, and he was probably watching me. I comforted myself with the realization he was scared of me, and I had a captive audience. He was either under the house or waiting in the forest trying not to make a sound by running. Zeke, I projected my voice with as much authority as I could. 
This is the sheriff department. We know it's you out there. I did a 360 scan around me with my flashlight as I slowly continued. You haven't broken any laws yet. Go home now and that's the end of it. If I have to come back, you are definitely going to jail. I promise that. As I finished my speech, I let the silence hang in the air for dramatic effect. Thunder rolled in the distance to punctuate my seriousness. Feeling confident in my ultimatum, I sloshed my way back to my patrol car. But don't get me twisted, dear listener. I'm not inept or cowardly. Oh, I had a plan and leaving was a ruse. When I got to my car, I called dispatch to tell her the plan. I told her to let our caller know I was going to drive back to the stop sign down the road and dark out to wait for Zeke to return. Soon, I was back in my car with all the lights out, staring down the dark road towards the house. As I sat in the darkness listening to the chaotic storm envelop me, I checked my phone. Only ten minutes had passed, when I swear it had been an eternity. The strange dreamlike feeling flooded over me again. I had a quick thought telling me I never should have gone to the house in the first place. I'd been just sitting here imagining the whole series of events that had just passed. Unsure, I patted my ankles to see if they were still wet. They weren't. I, I'd never trudged in the water to check on the scared mother. But I remembered doing it. I don't know. Things are so foggy. I had the sudden urge to cry. Didn't know why. I just felt scared. So alone. Nothing made sense. I fought back a sob. A harsh voice spoke to me, cutting through my confusion like a poisoned knife through my brain. It said I should just end it. I should just use the tool holstered on my hip. Oh, I put my head against the coolness of my window. Hot tears ran down my face as my hand fumbled with the retention locks on my holster. The coolness of the window was my only relief before the end. Good thing it was snowing. The snow always made me sad as it formed a white coat of ice on my windows. Wait, what? Snow? In Texas? I jolted with a gasp in my seat, as if waking from a dream. Maybe I was. A micro-dream? Well, I had had a couple of those in marine boot due to sleep deprivation. But why had it happened now? I shook my head vigorously to get my bearings back. The dark thoughts fled from me. I realized the power on the street must have gone out while I was in my reverie, because no light was coming from any of the houses. Visibility was zero, and the storm was a deafening cacophony by now. Alone with my thoughts in the darkness, I doubted my plan. I had had enough of my mind playing tricks on me and wondered how long I should just sit here like a creeper until I had to go back to regular patrol. My phone lit up and I jumped to answer it before it could even ring. I immediately recognized my dispatcher's voice, but it sounded too far away. He's back. Right now, he... Her voice cut out and the... Call drop noise chimed in my ear. Yeah, sometimes the cell towers were spotty out here, especially during storms. Now I had a useless phone I couldn't call back up with. My only hope was that my dispatcher would get my partner rolling my way. He was around 30 minutes to an hour away, remember. As I slammed my door behind me and began slogging through the rain, I thought to myself, on nights like this, I knew the future. I could just imagine the darkest timeline of events, and it would happen. The thought of my cell phone crapping out had been a whisper in my mind since the night began. I didn't bring it to the forefront of my thoughts in hope it wouldn't manifest, but it came true along with all the other bad vibes of the night. I prayed no more latent fears would come to fruition, especially the deepest fear we all have suppressed every time we wear a badge. I was splashing through the mini ocean leading up to the front porch when I heard the screaming of the child. Not the normal screaming of a fussy infant, but a sharp, raspy scream 
as if the child's throat was hurting from the exertion. Out came my gun again as I quickly ran towards the steep stairs. I did a quick duck to scan under the house with my light before I positioned myself beside the narrow stairs. I didn't go up them due to hearing about cops being shot off porches through closed doors as soon as they announced themselves. I banged on the lower part of the door with a fist and announced myself. I waited a beat for an answer or a gunshot. None came, so I weighed my options. I didn't have consent or a search warrant, but what I did have was good old exigent circumstance. Oh, exigent circumstance is what firefighters use to kick your door in when they smell smoke. As long as I believe danger is on the other side of the door, I can ram it in. The baby screams became choking coughs, and I heard something thump loudly inside. I hopped up the stairs and prepared to launch my shoulder into the door. A tiny voice in my head urged me to see if the door was unlocked. It should still be locked from last time, but I tried it anyways. It opened a crack, and I was hit with an awful stench. The closest thing I can compare it to is someone with a severe sinus infection waking up with morning breath, having eaten rotten eggs, and they blew it in your face. I pulled my head back to see a bulging eye staring at me from the top corner of the door, but this eye reflected like a cat's or a raccoon. It stared down at me with a dotted purple. In the split second before I kicked that door open, I could see the eye glint with purple and then retreat. I could hear a growl of a dog as the door swung open to the darkness within. My flashlight and my weapon swung around frantically searching for a dog or tall intruder with red eyes. I saw nothing but a living room. TV to my right, couch to my left counter in front of me separating the living room from the kitchen. I could hear the child screaming and coughing from the hallway to my left. I took a couple of tentative steps towards the cries when a figure rushed out of the hallway towards me. I let out a yell and leveled my glock to fire. I thank God I froze for an instant instead of shooting reflexively. In that split second that followed, I saw the mother with her head tilted sideways and her eyes rolled back. Her arms were trailing limply behind her as she fell. I sidestepped out of her way and she crumpled to the floor beside me with a thud. In hindsight, maybe I should have caught her. But maybe part of me knew she'd been thrown, so I kept my weapon aimed down the hallway. Or, that's what I tell myself anyways. The hallway was only six feet long. A bedroom to the right and left with a bathroom in the middle. I had been in countless trailers with this layout. The bathroom door was closed, so whoever threw her could be to the right or the left taking cover. I could see both of the doors were open. I spared a glance down at the woman. She was on her side facing me. Young and attractive, she was only in a light shirt and underwear. Her eyes were open and she was breathing in quick short bursts. Her eyes had a trance-like stare and I could see her skin glistened with a layer of sweat. I couldn't see blood or any physical injuries on her. And she reminded me of a fish taken out of water, slowly dying. When I returned my gaze to the hallway, my brain couldn't make sense of what I was seeing. It appeared the hallway had gotten longer. Where my flashlight had once illuminated the bathroom door, now there was only pitch blackness. I moved my flashlight back and forth to reveal the darkness was a fixed object, like a cloud at the lip of the doorway. Even as I squinted and tried to grasp what I was seeing, the darkness seemed to grow closer. It leaked out like a fog into the living room. The door frame faded to blackness, then the walls around it, then parts of the couch beside it. The best way I can explain it is, it looked like the world in front of me was disappearing, being swallowed by the void. The dark reached out across the room to flood after me. I looked down to see the world drop off into nothingness about a foot away from me. The bare legs of the woman laying beside me had already been consumed by it. I 
tried in vain to wave the darkness away with my light, but to no avail. I backed into the TV and knocked it over. Familiar panic began to boil over within me as the dark whispers tore through my mind again. It was the same despair I'd felt back in the car. I wasn't afraid of dying on the job, but this was different. What was this darkness? What unimaginable terror waited for me in the approaching void? Would it take me to hell? If I died here, would God even see me? The darkness was just out of arm's reach when the glow of my flashlight was snuffed out and I was plunged into absolute dark. My last light of hope disappearing caused a primal scream to build up in my throat. One last terrified plea before the madness overtook me. Oh God. Oh Jesus. I blinked rapidly as my flashlight sprung back to life, illuminating the room around me. The unnatural darkness had retreated. I blinked repeatedly as the horrid thoughts flew through me, leaving me shaking and whimpering. I fought the urge to run out of the door and forget stupid ideas like honour and duty. As I supported myself against the TV, leaning against the wall, I began to catch my breath. I did a couple of rounds of combat breathing to lower my racing heart. I also let out a curse word every other exhale. I had a job to do and I knew I had to replace paralysing fear with something else. Life had taught me anger could override fear and pushed you past exhaustion in a pinch. I also steadied myself with a mental checklist. I would finish this call. I'd find the baby, call an ambulance for mum, and stop Zeke. Or whatever it was out here. Then I could go 10-8 and drink coffee at the office. Everything would be like normal. I knelt down to check on the mother. She wouldn't respond to anything I asked her. Her pupils were as big as saucers and showed no reaction to my light. A brief pat down revealed no apparent injuries. But then I heard it again. The soft cry of an infant. But it wasn't coming from the hallway. It sounded closer. I shut up and immediately saw a figure to the right of my periphery. I twirled to highlight a dark figure of a person standing in the kitchen. The figure's back was turned to me with shoulders hunched. It wore a ratty black raincoat, torn and frayed. Let me see your hands, I yelled. The figure didn't budge. I could hear him mumbling as he bobbed his shoulder. Hey, listen to me, asshole. I swear to God I will shoot you. Hands up. Turn around, slowly. I could hear him start softly cooing. But my hands are full, deputy. He croaked as he slowly turned around. It was Zeke. He was cradling the baby in his arms. My whole body tensed up at this sight. The child couldn't have been more than a year old. I could see the child moving its arms and wiggling about. Thank God for that. But Zeke's grip was firmly around the base of its skull. His disgusting hand palming its delicate head like he was holding a baseball. The dirty nail of his on-pointer finger gently tapping the child's nose. I mentally weighed my options. Seeing Zeke holding the child reminded me of how terrified I felt when I first held my newborn nephew. He was so fragile. I thought I could crush him on accident. I knew Zeke was playing upon that fear to keep me at bay. I could shoot him in the face. It wouldn't be the hardest shot to make. He wasn't but seven feet from me, but he would drop the baby. As if sensing my thoughts, Zeke let go of the child's head and it dangled upside down by the leg. Now the child commenced the screaming as it swung back and forth like a pendulum. Zeke outstretched his arm, presenting the baby to me purposefully holding the baby directly in front of the muzzle of my gun. Take the shot. Kill the bad guy. Save the family. Zeke hissed. It's what you trained all these years for. He took a step towards me, shortening the distance to about four feet. 
I could see the tears pouring out of the child's chubby face, running down its forehead to sprinkle to the floor. I pulled my gun away from the child and held it close to my chest, terrified to have something so dangerous so close to something so precious. I took a half step back when I realized I was losing my one advantage. Zeke thought I had tunnel vision on shooting him. He expected me to step back and keep my distance like cops were trained to do, but I always liked a good fight. I quickly came up with a plan to holster my weapon while rushing him. I grabbed the baby with my offhand while giving him a low kick right to the knee. I catch him off guard by springing my attack in the middle of telling him something. Something everybody knew. Zeke, listen to me. You have the right to remain silent. My gun started to lower to my holster, my offhand pointing the light in his eyes. Anything you say can be used against you. A grin began to widen on Zeke's face. If you cannot afford a... I tensed to attack. Zeke whipped the baby into the air. Time slowed around me as I saw the child arch upwards to almost hit the ceiling. I must have instinctively dropped my weapon and light as my arms reached to catch the baby as it descended. My hands searched the darkness where my brain predicted the falling child should be. I felt its soft body and eagerly pulled the child to my chest. The instant my brain confirmed I'd secured the infant, my eyesight exploded with stars as my head rocked back. While reeling backwards, another blow hit the inside of my right knee. I buckled and fell to my back the gear on my duty belt jamming painfully into me. The entire time, my arms desperately wrapped around the screaming child. I immediately began frantically searching the ground around me with my right hand. I could not let Zeke get my weapon. I began to sit up and roll to my side in a desperate attempt to shield the baby. I received a crushing knee to the belly as Zeke landed on me with all his weight. I let out a grunt of pain and wrapped the child tighter to my chest. He straddled me and pulled himself closer by the collar of my overvest. I could tell his telltale stench cascading off of him, his enlarged eyes staring into mine. I realized with horror that Zeke had no intention of going for my gun. With a cray smile on his face, he embraced me in a hug and began to squeeze. He was going to use me to squeeze the life out of the baby. I had to recall my searching right hand to push back against Zeke, and we struggled like that for what seemed like an eternity. He was mounted on top of me, giving me a bear hug, and I desperately tried pushing him away with my right hand while shielding the baby with my left. And I knew the amount of force he was putting on me was unnatural. He was wiring about six inches shorter than me. I had at least forty pounds on the guy, and I was in decent shape. But I felt my back crack and I gasped as my muscles were quickly pushed to the point of muscle failure. The poor child began to wheeze as our bodies sandwiched him. I was getting desperate and my mind brought up a memory I'd tucked away for a rainy day, hoping I'd never have to use it. I remembered a salty former devil dog SWAT instructor teaching us room clearing tactics in the academy. It was the end of the day, and he began to share war stories about his time in the Corps. Uh, most people don't know the quickest way to kill someone is putting your thumb right through the bad guy's eye sockets, he'd said with a wicked smile, mimicking the action by thrusting his gnarled thumb with a quick jab. Straight into the brain, he finished as he twisted his thumb and made a squish sound with his mouth. Yeah, my body cringed just like yours did as you heard this. He must have seen the group of us cadets physically withdraw and continued. Ah, the trick is getting your brain to override your sense of basic human decency. Kill another human in this horrific way. Your mind will fight you on it. It's not natural to want to do this to your fellow man. Even now that you know it, you won't be able to do it when the time comes. Well, I was used to the mind games and hazing from alpha military types. Trying to scare us into quitting. I thought on what he'd said that day, unsure if I could kill a man or maim someone in such a horrible way. I would have to exhaust all other options. But now, as I lay on my back, my body failing, 
and a child being crushed between us, I had to dig deep to survive. Zeke blinked for the first time during this whole confrontation. A look of realization passed over him. He grinned even wider as he began to chuckle. He released me from his hug and quickly grabbed my head with both hands, his thumbs moving from my eyes. I closed my eyes as I felt his dirty thumbnail scrape across my eyelids. Panic leapt inside me as I realized what he was doing. Even though my eyes were closed, I had a mental picture of where he was. And my right hand struck out and my thumb pierced through something soft and warm. A warm liquid immediately engulfed my hand and splashed across my face. I didn't realize I was screaming until the copper-tasting liquid poured into my mouth. I could taste what it was, and I knew what I'd done. But I had to open my eyes to see. Zeke's grip had slackened enough for me to open my eyes to peek at the damage. Sure enough, my thumb was deeply embedded in Zeke's eye socket. He still grinned maniacally at me as blood oozed out of him. I pushed him up and away from me as I bucked and twisted frantically. He finally rolled off to my left and my thumb came free from him. I heard him kicking and thumping away from me as he retreated into the darkness. I sat up with the child and quickly searched to my right for my gun. I found it and snatched it up quickly and then scanned the room. I couldn't see Zeke so I scanned back and forth repeatedly. The child resumed its deafening scream, and I could feel my heart pounding through my entire body. After a couple of moments of pointing my weapon at the dark and cradling the child, my mind began to work again. I noticed how strange my weapon felt in my blood-covered hand. I noticed the screaming baby sounded loud and healthy, and I noticed we were both alone. Alone. The child's mother was missing. I sat there, overwhelmed, but first things first, I had to deal with the infant in my arms. Retrieving my light, I slowly stood and searched the room for a safe place to lay my screaming bundle. I settled with placing the baby on the floor and building up a pillow fort around it with throw pillows. I could feel precious seconds being wasted. As much as I wanted to stay with the baby, the longer Zeke was alone with the mother, well, with trepidation I stood to face the hallway. Zeke must have taken her back there. I stepped forward, deciding on the door to my right first. My kick blasted the door open as my light flooded the room. It revealed a woman's bedroom that had been completely trashed. It looked like an explosion had occurred from a large hole in the center of the room. Wood and torn carpet was scattered all across the area. The flooring was bent up and out was like something had come up through the bottom. I leaned over the hole to see down into the muddy ground beneath. Is this how Zeke got in? It looked like the Hulk had smashed his way up through the floor. Any other time I wouldn't have believed it, but sanity had left the moment I was dispatched to this house. I knew he could still be down there with her. If I crawled down there, I'd be putting myself in dangerously tight corridors with Zeke again. I didn't want another wrestling match with his freakish strength. A bolt of lightning crashed somewhere close, the bright strobe outlining a tall figure outside the bedroom window. I looked up to catch only a glimpse of it before it vanished, but it was a tall imposing humanoid figure of blackness with purple reflecting eyes. It must have been ten feet tall, pressing its hands and face against the other side of the glass. As quickly as I saw it, it winked out of existence, only after the image of it in my mind. I shuffled around the hole to look out the window. Standing further out in the backyard was a group of shadows. I didn't have to wait long for another lightning strike to illuminate the night. What the light exposed hardly surprised me, but it made me shudder anyways. It was Zeke, soaking in the rain, his outstretched arm holding the mother up by the back of her neck to face me. The unnatural ease in which he held her outwards was as effortless as he had held the baby. It was as if he was presenting her to me. 
A twisted grin dominated his bloodied, one-eyed face as she hung limply. He beckoned me with his free hand to come before turning curtly and strolling for the woods with her. I spat a curse at him as he faded into the trees. I had to get her back. I couldn't care less if he got away in the end, but I couldn't live with my final memory of her being taken by that grinning cyclops. He'd sought her out this night, and I had to stop whatever morbid plans he'd had for her. I ran back into the kitchen and located a back door. I flew out into the cold rain, jumping down the slick steps and sprinting towards the woods. I could see where the foliage parted to make a small pathway, and this was around the place I'd last spotted Zeke, so he must have taken it. Once I hit the tree line, my momentum almost came to a stop. The water sloshed up to my knees as I took heavy steps forward. After trudging a few yards into the woods, I spotted a glimpse of movement pulling away from me. Every time I thought I'd lost Zeke's trail, I'd see him slipping further into the darkness, dragging the poor woman with him. My legs burned as I forced myself forward through the deep foliage. I tried to keep Zeke in my sights through the blinding trees and vines. I don't know how long I chased after him. Time did its weird thing again. I fell into a fugue state of desperation and exhaustion. All I knew was... I had to keep moving forward. Though I was surrounded by a thick forest, I felt isolated, like I was floating in the void of space or standing at the edge of a great chasm. The darkness outside the reach of my light was a void into nothing. It seemed only the immediate area where I stood was solid. The only things tangible around me were the figures my light discovered. As soon as I moved past the ground I stood on, or my light passed by the surroundings, the matter returned to nothing. I could fall into the abyss and never be heard from again. Another soul lost to the forest. How long would it take before people noticed I was missing? Maybe it would be deemed important enough for a small local news report. My sheriff might call in reserves and troopers to have the woods search for me, but after a couple of weeks it would be called off. Too expensive to keep up. I know because I've seen it happen a couple of times. I would just be gone. No one would really know that I had been swallowed up by despair. That I had glitched out of this reality to be forever falling in darkness. In my grim reverie of stalking after Zeke, I was vaguely aware of something shadowing me. From my peripherals I catch the dark figure with purple eyes keeping pace with me. I could smell the stink of B.O. and bad breath wafting around me. I wanted to turn my head and face the creature directly, but was too afraid of losing the track of Zeke. He was pulling further and further away from me as my body screamed for rest. Zeke disappeared through some shrubbery, and I yelled in frustration as I urged myself to speed up. The corners of my vision faded, and I knew I was on the verge of passing out. On the cusp of falling into the water in exhaustion, I broke through the shrubs and entered a clearing. I looked around in wonder, a perfect circle with a thirty-yard diameter. In the middle of the clearing stood an old tree stump, jutting three feet out of the water. I could see a small sapling shooting out of the dead tree, its skinny branches reaching about fifteen feet above the water. With a flash of lightning, I noticed Zeke standing next to the tree, holding the slumping woman by the collar. He had his hand reached up, playing with something swinging from the tree. As I stumbled over, I could see it was a noose. Ah, something old for something new, Zeke proclaimed loudly, still focused on the noose. This is what my Jesus demands. The way he said, my Jesus, made it clear it wasn't the Jesus Joel Olstein was peddling. He finally turned to face me. With an effortless and fluid motion, he hoisted the limp woman atop the tree stump. Ah, oh, it's got to be something sweet, he says. Zeke groaned, his one eye throwing daggers at me. Maybe it can be you. Let's see what he says. But someone hangs from the tree. I want you, though. You and the baby are just a bonus. 
after the massacre, I returned to stomp the life out of that child. I had had about enough of this cryptic voodoo talk and threats. I knew I couldn't take him hand to hand, but now he couldn't use the woman as a shield. I leveled my pistol and fired two quick bursts. My ears rang after the shots, the smell of gunpowder enveloping me. Two sporadic sounds of bloop, bloop as the casings hit the water. I closed the gap between us to about five yards. An easy shot. So why didn't Zeke go down? Not even a flinch. I figured excitement and heart rate had made me miss. So in anger, I squeezed off five more rounds while marching towards him. It felt like I was shooting through a shadow. He just stared at me with his cyclops eye. Then, when I came to about seven feet, I stopped. We stared at each other for a while, him glaring while I breathed raggedly. The only movement was the downpour around us. I knew I was out of options. It began to dawn on me I was going to die out here with the girl. We were both going to die, and I couldn't save her. I'd chosen to chase this possessed man to the place from where I would never return. A willing sacrifice. A mental picture flashed through my head. I'd be laid out on the tree stump, like a tribute on an altar, while the woman hung lifeless from the branch above me. Zeke smiled at me and gave a short laugh. He stretched his arms out wide, as if welcoming me for a hug. And that's when I saw it. No more hiding in the corners of my vision. It revealed itself to me. A tall figure peeked out from the hangman tree behind Zeke, his purple eyes glinting. I saw it clearly as I ever could. The inky black profile of a humanoid standing three feet taller than Zeke. It was made out of the same unnatural blackness that had almost consumed me back in the house. My light was useless at dispersing it. It stretched out an unnaturally long hand to lay it atop Zeke's head. Zeke closed his remaining eye and began to quiver, shaking like a holy ghost televangelist. No, deputy, Zeke spoke in a throaty cackle. He jerked his head from side to side, the entity never releasing its grip. Zeke gave a terrible cough and heaved his chest like he was about to throw up. It was as if his body was trying to reject the monster leeching off of him. My Jesus has made a decision. He wants the woman. She has a sweetness most deserving defilement, a kindness to rip and tear. Her desecration will be an agony felt most by those who love her. In return, I receive his gifts. Ah, the fruits of the Spirit. Once again, I felt the world around me fall out of focus. Some dark magic was pulling me under a trance. The veil of reality thinned and the cold darkness waited for my soul to fall in. I was so tired. Why fight it? I lazily put my gun back in its holster and nonchalantly dropped my light into the water. I felt the cold creep up my body like terrible claws. The unnatural cold took over, and I realized I couldn't move. Or I didn't want to move. Either way, it didn't matter. I realized the rain had stopped. Turned off like a switch. I moved my eyes around in my frozen head to see millions of droplets frozen in the air. It was as if time had stopped and the rain was suspended like little planets floating against a dark galaxy. Zeke looked up and marveled at the sight. The dark entity moved out from behind the tree. My eyes were adjusted enough to the moonlight in the clearing to see the inky black mass getting closer. Panic rose within me. I didn't want that thing any closer. Not to touch me, I just knew if it touched me it would be the most violating thing ever. But I still didn't move. It was useless to resist. The darkness was inevitable. It lowered itself in front of me, its glinting saucer eyes staring into mine. And of course, that overwhelming smell followed. 
It reached out a pitch black hand to lay on top of my head. When it touched, a jolt of energy shot through me. I could feel its hate, its disgust towards me. But it wasn't just me, it was everything, even Zeke. Yeah, Zeke was just a means to an end. A plaything used to spread wrath and to hurt others. But then, the real event started. As I stood there, dumbstruck, it showed me things. I saw the woman standing. It told me her name was Elisa. She wore the same blank look that I had. And then realization flooded back into her face. She blinked rapidly and began to whimper. She made eye contact with Zeke, with me, then the dark figure. Her eyes bulged as if pleading for escape. What followed then, I am not sure of. Time was hard to measure, but it felt like an eternity. I don't know if it was real or I was in a trance. Maybe it was a little of both both of us locked away in cracks in reality. This crack that let the darkness in to infect and corrupt. I stood motionless with tears streaming down my face as they tortured Elisa right in front of me. Zeke ravished her in countless ways with the entity hovering closely over his shoulder. Knives and cutting instruments would be handed to him out of the dark mass of the thing. They committed acts of violence which I will never repeat, never describe. But I could see Elisa felt all of it. She would scream through gritted teeth, her eyes bulging so much it seemed as if they would pop out. At the end of the mutilation, Elisa always ended up hanging from the noose. In a malicious display of sadism, Elisa would be granted the use of her desecrated body, she would thrash around and weakly try to free herself from the rope around her neck. But she never got free. But right before she stopped struggling, the scene would reset, jump back in time, and she would be completely healed and standing there in the water, trapped in her own body, waiting for the ritual to begin again. Don't know how long it went on. Maybe hours, maybe days. Time had no meaning. As the macabre show played out on repeat again and again, I began to lose hope just as assuredly as Alyssa must have. I'd given up. I had failed. I was a fool and deserved this cruel fate. I maybe even deserved worse. No. I deserved worse. It was this self-defeating statement that turned out to be my salvation the lifeline to pull me out of the bottomless pit that I was sinking into, but at first it was just another arrow to my heart, another stone tied around my feet. I did deserve worse. It should be me up there. I'd taken the job to help people like her, and how I had failed. Standing on the sidelines watching this mother be assaulted on repeat. I had no kids. I was just a single, useless man. Nobody would really miss me. Not like her. Yes, I should take her place. This thought sparked through my mind like lightning. It was my job to stand in front of the innocent when the wolf came. Zeke spoke of sacrifice. Yeah, I could take her place. Maybe find some semblance of honour for my pathetic actions. I felt a warmth begin to grow inside of me. Zeke had cut Elisa hundreds of times and now led her to step on the stump so he could put the rope around her neck. I didn't know what was happening at the time. My brain was still caught in a feverish cycle of self-hate, wanting to take her place, hating it was her instead of me. I began to regain control of my body, and I moved sluggishly towards Zeke, but he was too preoccupied with Elisa. I saw the entity spin around to face me, his eyes somehow bigger. I let out a deep growl that reverberated in my brain, but it did not attack. Zeke had fastened the rope around Elisa's neck and stepped down to admire his work. Elisa let out an audible whimper as tears flooded her eyes. She knew what was coming. Maybe she prayed she'd be allowed to die this time. Jump, Zeke said, grinning through his teeth. Elisa stepped off the stump and began to choke. 
her legs kicking slightly as she swung back and forth. I noticed she didn't even attempt to remove the noose. She had given up. No! I screamed as I shouldered past Zeke. He reeled back in surprise. I ran up and grabbed Elisa's legs and lifted, taking the strain off her neck. Oh, let me do it. It needs to be me, not her, not her! I screamed with insane fervor. It took Elisa a moment to realize I'd finally come to her aid. I screamed for her to take off the noose. She began squirming and pulling at the rope around her neck. I lifted her up further and stabilized her enough to remove the rope and topple us both over into the water. Oh, the cold of the water completely knocked my body out of its sluggish stupor, but my mind was still all haywire. I pulled Elisa out of the water and leaned her against the tree trunk. She stared back at me and began screaming as she wrapped her arms around me. She hid her face in my chest and refused to even look up at the monsters. I could feel her body quivering against mine as she continued to let out muffled screams. I tried to turn to face Seek, but Elisa held me too tight, so I just looked over my shoulder. I noticed it was raining again. Time was unfrozen. No, take me instead. I pleaded. She's had enough. She's done. I'm a willing sacrifice. Let her sins be mine. I don't know where that last sentence came from. Divine intervention? I just don't know. My mind was still in a tailspin of misery. All I know is the entity didn't like it. I heard a loud, unnatural yell. A bark, a growl. The closest thing I can compare it to is a mix between a baboon and a jaguar. It was terrifying, and I knew it had come from the tall shadow. As if it was a command, Zeke started raining blows down on my head, pounding hammer fists over and over. I squeezed Elisa closer to shield her from the blows. I could take the pain. I wanted the pain. Zeke then tried to pull me off of her, but I held on. And that's when I realized Zeke had lost his strength. His blows hurt, but they were the blows of a normal man. He couldn't even pull me away from Elisa. A small beacon of hope bloomed in my soul. Zeke began cursing me. Hopefully he was reading my mind as I thought the most heinous things about him. But then he reached for my gun on my hip. I have a level 3 retention holster, meaning you have to press a button hold it down and rock it forward to release the gun. It takes practice, but Zeke manipulated it so smoothly and immediately pulled it away from me. I half turned to face him, still shielding Elisa away from him. Zeke huffed and pointed my gun at me with a shaky hand. You would die for her, pig? He screamed at me. Yes, you backwards inbred. I spat in defiance. I had already accepted my fate. If I was to die, at least it would mean Elisa would survive. One honorable thing during a life of failure. I'll kill you, and I'll kill your girl anyways, Zeke shrieked. I closed my eyes and waited for the hot bullets to pierce my body. Oh, what does it feel like being shot? Will he make it quick or go for the head? Closed casket for sure, but... The shots never came. Ten seconds felt like ten hours before I opened my eyes. Zeke's face was one of confusion. His body quivered as his eye twitched around in its socket. That's when I finally noticed the entity had placed a hand back on Zeke's head. Zeke gritted his teeth and let out a huff of frustration. It didn't take long for me to realize Zeke was frozen like Elisa had been. Let me do it, Zeke begged. The muscles in his neck strained and his outstretched arm twitched. I could tell Zeke desperately wanted to put the required pressure on the trigger to blow my face off. He tried to look at the entity even though his head couldn't move. The creature was just inches from him, just outside of his field of vision, and began to whisper in his ear. Zeke's expression transformed from anger to fear. No, we had an agreement, Zeke pleaded. His hand sprung open and dropped the gun with a splash. 
and now his expression turned to anger. You forsake me. You liar. I still have time. I still have power. He's just a damn idiot. I'll get you the girl. The entity shot another hand into Zeke's chest and let out a sharp hiss. Zeke's face contorted in pain, and he began to cough. The shadow creature grew bigger, towering over him. Slowly it pulled him into its dark mass, enveloping him completely. Zeke began to cry out in high-pitched yelps as his body disintegrated into the blackness. It looked like he was bent over backwards with the entity pushing him inwards by the top of the head. Before his head was consumed, he looked at me and begged. Just a little more power. Let me kill this cop. And then Zeke's head was pushed in and he was no more. Only the looming shadow creature with the purple glinting eye. I cradled Elisa's drenched and shaking body tightly. I tried to meet the creature's piercing stare, but it was just too much. It projected so much anger into my heart. I knew this must be the end. At least Zeke wouldn't get the satisfaction. But I didn't know what untold horrors the creature would perform on me. Maybe I'd be taken away like Zeke, locked away within this unholy creature. Just, just leave her, I said. The entity just stared back silently, the rain wiping around it. Then I heard a deep rumbling coming from within it. Was it laughter? It was. A wicked sound. It began to back away from me as the deep chuckle continued. The thing made it to the edge of the tree line and all I could see was its reflecting eyes floating in the storm. And just like that, it disappeared. Just like that, it was over. It took a minute for it to register with my rattled mind, but I knew in my heart it had left. The fog over my soul had lifted. I sat Elisa on the stump and stared up into the sky. The rain felt refreshing instead of drowning. I won't bore you with the after-action report or the mountain of paperwork that followed, but... I fished my gun out of the water, and I silently helped Elisa limp back to her house. Not a word said between us. What was there to say? Oh, and backup still wasn't there yet. The baby was fine, if not a little bruised, and the EMTs took Elisa to the hospital. She'd returned to a semi-catatonic state, not saying anything for about a week. She finally did start talking again, but she claimed she didn't remember anything. I consider that a mercy. She and her child went to live with her parents. They told me she had extreme night terrors every night, but quickly forgot them upon waking. Well, hopefully she can have a normal life for her child, but she will never be the same. Oh, evil had left its stain on her. I kept my report short and sweet. I wisely chose to admit the shadow monster and the hell dimension of torture Elisa was in. I left out the part about emptying seven rounds into an unkillable demon-powered man. I just told the narrative of chasing Zeke out of the house and into the woods where I rescued Elisa. Oh, and Zeke may have an injury to his eye. It was too dark to tell how bad I'd hurt him. That same night, Zeke's brother died. He was in the papers the next day. He was locked up in the neighbouring county. He'd suffered a heart attack in his cell. There was a whole investigation. The video showed him banging on the door and crying for help, but there was a big fight in another part of the jail, and nobody heard or paid attention to his cries as he died alone. I stayed with the department for another month. They put out a warrant on Zeke for burglary and assaulting a police officer, but I never expected him to turn up. Until one day, he did. My sergeant had come into the office with a big smile on his face. He let me know they'd found my guy. He said Zeke had been found on some hunting lease in a neighbouring county. Sarge slapped down a folder with pictures in it. I opened it up to see a familiar sight. A clearing with a tree stump in the middle another younger tree growing out of the middle of it, 
and there hung the body of Zeke, dangling from the noose, his body bloated and rotten. I turned the page to see a picture with a closer view. He wore the ratty black raincoat, and his left eye was missing. What happened? I asked incredulously. Well, some hunter found old Zeke about a week ago. I guess he got tired of running and laughed himself. My sergeant spoke, matter-of-factly. Strange thing is, the coroner said he'd been up there for months. Well, kind of messes up your timetable of events. Uh, maybe the dark's a quack. Uh, some heat does speed up decom. He was at least up there long enough for the birds to get at his eyes. I felt sick. I had a strange feeling that the Zeke I'd encountered had somehow been hanging from that tree at the same time. Some sort of cruel trick played out by the power of the purple-eyed shadow. I don't know how I knew this. It's just like I'd always known. Before my sergeant walked into his office, he turned to face me. Can you believe the bullets were found in him? Well, post-mortem, they say, but... People must have hated him enough to do some target practice instead of reporting him. I left the department shortly after that. You see, I'd been changed too, like Elisa. Driving alone at night, I'd be terrified of the shadows moving in my peripherals, hoping I wouldn't catch a glint of purple. I knew that thing was still out there, waiting for me on every call I went to. I could turn any corner to see it looming there, staring at me with its hate-filled eyes. I don't know what stopped him from taking me that night, or why he stilled Zeke's hand from pulling the trigger. Maybe it was my willingness to sacrifice myself. Something pure in the midst of evil. God, I hope it was. Rather it be Harry Potter logic or Sunday school logic, well, I don't care. No greater love, right? But then, well, then there's the darker thought, the one that keeps me up at night. I volunteered, I made a deal. Maybe the thing decided to honor my deal over Zeke's. Maybe I owe a debt that hasn't been paid yet, and the entity is just waiting, hoping I'll forget before he comes for me, pushing me into the void like he did Zeke. I work at another depleted... I work at another police department now. I took a step back to work in dispatch. Call of the wild still affects me. I want to get back in a black and white and be in the field. I know I can't live in fear. I have to reclaim my life. The test for a patrol position is coming up and I've already signed up. But there is a part of me I suppress every day just to keep moving. It lingers in the recesses of my mind. I just know it for some reason, like I do other dark things now. Whether on my deathbed at 90 or answering another disturbance call tomorrow, I will see it again. It's inevitable. It knows me now. It marked me. Those purple eyes fill with hate. Zeke's Jesus. Bloody hell, that was a bit messed up, wasn't it? What on earth do you think of that one? I do like these stories occasionally where the uh, protagonist is um, not sure if they're awake or living a nightmare. Um, it kind of makes for a well, a very interesting uh, <laughs> sort of uh, dialogue, but yeah, um, something about that one really piqued my interest and I'm really, really delighted to have been able to read it for you. So yeah, here I am on Tuesday night. I should be on my other channel, shouldn't I? Well, I'm going to mix things up a little bit for the next week or two, as I've got a bit of momentum going with the longer stories. Um, you know, I like to do the longer stories here and shorter ones over on the second channel, so keep posted, because I'm not quite sure what's going to come up when. So, I'll be over on the other channel tomorrow night anyway. You know what? That's enough for me for one night. Very, very sweet dream. Some bye-bye.